Well, you're most welcome to today's talk, Sunday evening, the 25th of September. Now, I'm going to be reporting today on really quite a concerning report from the United States. It's a very large scale study. It is early data, but it's a very large scale study indicating a, a significant increase in risk for dementia after COVID. Actually, a 69% increase in risk of Alzheimer's disease specifically, and we'll be looking at that. And so far, the data is checking out, I'm afraid. Now, the implications of this are quite concerning. Now, to be fair, this study is retrospective, so there could be some gaps in the data, but it is looking quite convincing so far. Whether this is causing Alzheimer's, perhaps not. Um, whether it's triggering Alzheimer's is probably more likely, but we can't say that definitively yet. Now, Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia, of course. There's frontotemporal dementia, um, that used to be called Pick's disease. There's Lewy bodies dementia. There's a, a ischemic or atherosclerotic dementia. There's different types of dementia. In practice, they're very often mixed. You get different pathologies in a single individual. But in all dementia, there is a progressive, irreversible impairment of intellectual function. So it's progressive and it's irreversible. Now, in delirium, there's an impairment of intellectual function, but that's reversible. If you take away the cause, the person can get, well, will get better. But dementia is, by definition, irreversible because the brain cells are not dividing. And there's progressive disorientation, first for time, then for place, and then ultimately for person. And I'd be surprised if there's anyone here watching, certainly people in middle age and older age, um, who haven't been personally touched by dementia. I've had three close relatives uh, that I've had the uh, the distress uh, of watching with uh, progressive uh, dementia, and I'm sure it's the same for, for many of you. Anyway, let's get straight on to this data now. Now, this is the first report I'm looking at here is the, a report from the University of Minnesota. We'll be checking this out, but the bottom line is that this number does actually check out when we look at the data. It is a significant increase in risk. Now, it affects the older COVID survivors more uh, and they have a 69% increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, um, this could include other forms of dementia because to tell the difference between Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, you would need fairly sophisticated techniques such as MRI scanning. So I suspect that they're looking at a, a variety of dementias here that they're classifying as Alzheimer's disease. Looking at the pathology, we'll probably find some, many of them were mixed, I'm sure. But we'll call it out, so we'll go with Alzheimer's disease, which of course is by far and away the most common form of uh, uh, dementia in the elderly. Now, this is within one year of infection of COVID. Now, the reason that this is concerning is they looked at the medical records of 6.2 million people. That This is a huge amount uh, over the age of 65 who'd had medical visits, uh, but no previous diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So these were people who happened to go to the nurses or doctors anyway. Uh, but had no previous diagnosis. So it's a very large number of people that were seeking healthcare advice. And of course, dementia is already, as we've said, remarkably common. And if that number is increasing, even, even if it's only a few percent increase, that's a huge burden of, uh, of uh, morbidity, uh, human pain, suffering and distress, and of course, uh, huge um, demands on, on healthcare services because the typical prognosis for dementia is about 10 years. People typically live 10 years after uh, diagnosis. So one or two of my relatives, it's been much less, but, but typically that's what we would expect. Um, February 20 to May 2021. So it's a reasonable time period. Now, in this study, there was four, four, um, 410,000 people uh, tested positive. And... Um, 5.8 million did not test positive. So that means we've got pretty good groups. So this is, in, in essence, the experimental group. So just over 400,000 tested positive, and they had to compare those with a control group of 5.8 million. These are the sort of numbers that researchers dream of. With these large numbers, we can get very accurate uh, data. As, as we talked about in yesterday's video, actually, the larger the numbers, the more accurate the data is going to be. Now, um, COVID-19 survivors had a 69% increase, a higher risk uh, of a new diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease within one year of infection than their uninfected peers. 
So these are the, 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 the these people are the ones that had uh, COVID here. Uh, these are their uninfected peers here. And the difference between the two was 69% higher risk of uh, being diagnosed. Hazard ratio 1.69. This is uh, a big extra risk. And the research is a 95% positive. The real value is between 1.53 and 1.72. That's what they took as their statistical most likely number. So only a 5% chance it's less than that. 1.53, uh, only a 5% chance it's higher than that. So pretty sure really about these results. Most at risk were patients over the age of 85. Where are we? Most at risk patients over the age of 85, their hazard ratio was 1.89, that's 89% 80, uh, increased risk. Women also are higher risk than men, 82% um, increased risk. So highest risk in those two groups. Now this comes from this paper here, um, Association of COVID-19 with New Orleans to Alzheimer's Disease. And this is published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, check it out for yourself, that's the link. Published in the 13th of September so bang up to date research, peer reviewed, very reputable international journal. So no serious question marks about the quality of the data in this study. The interpretation, yes, we can argue about that. The quality of the data is good, is very, very good. Uh, infectious disease of Alzheimer's disease, uh, infectious etiology of Alzheimer's disease has been postulated for decades. Now, of course, in the UK, we put an A in the front to make it etiology, but the etiology, etiology, it's the same. Um, so people have been talking about the possible uh, causes of Alzheimer's disease could potentially, or one of the factors could potentially be, if not the sole factor, could be infection, particularly viral infections, particularly viral infections which cause um, systemic inflammation, as we know sars coronavirus uh, can do. Um, been postulated for years no particular uh, definitive data on it but it's it, it is it is a very reasonable proposition um so the question is is sars coronavirus 2 infection associated with increased risk for alzheimer's disease was the point of the study retrospective is the weakness in this study but as we said made up for by the large numbers and this was the, the this was the numbers they do check out 6.2 million uh, people with COVID were at significant increased risk for new onset of Alzheimer's disease. Within one year, 360 days of initial diagnosis. Now, the propensity, what you call the propensity matching score, um, the people with um, the, 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 the people with uh, COVID-19, the, the risks there was uh, 0.68. And for the non-COVID non and for the non -COVID group, it was 0.35%. And when you take the difference between these two numbers, you find out that the people in the COVID cohort had a, uh, had a 69%, uh, so, sorry, 69, yeah, 69% increased probability of getting the disease. So yes, people with non-COVID were being diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but at a lower rate than people who had had the COVID. That's the key difference. And it's the difference between these two numbers that gives the hazard ratio and that's what gives the increased 69% chance. Now, this comes from Trina X, recognized uh, analytical platform in the States. De-identified electronic health records, 95 uh, million participants. As we said, only 6.25 of those went to see nurses or doctors. Um, inpatient and outpatient visits, um, 68 health organizations, 28% of the US population covering 50 states, covering diverse geographic areas, age, race, uh, race, ethnicity, income and insurance group. So I'm afraid this is a representative sample of the population of the United States, which is why this is a concern. Uh, the author state, um, our findings call for research to understand the underlying mechanisms and for continuous surveillance of long-term impacts of COVID-19 on Alzheimer's disease. So we need to work out what is going wrong here in terms of pathology. This means that basically we need to be doing investigations looking at 
the systemic factors, the chest x-rays, the ECGs, the uh, EEGs, the, all the blood tests, all these things need to be investigated. And of course, crucially, uh, we need uh, autopsy studies as well to, to identify the specific pathologies uh, that these patients were suffering from and hopefully from that identify a pathophysiological mechanism if we could identify the pathophysiological mechanism we could then interfere with that mechanism hopefully to prevent it that would be the aim and of course the authors are very aware, aware of this not clear whether COVID-19 triggers or accelerates the development of Alzheimer's disease at the moment given that it's older people my thinking is it's probably more likely to uh accelerate the development rather than trigger it from scratch but of course we simply don't know we simply don't know um, we need more data on that sars coronavirus 2 has been associated with inflammation of the central nervous system uh, and central nervous system disorders so this does make sense uh, it does make sense prior infection especially viral infections and inflammation have been associated with uh, potential dementia in the past some viral infections, of course, that cause frank brain uh, inflammation will cause irreversible brain damage, which does cause an irreversible impairment of intellectual function. Although it tends to happen all at once, whereas dementia is progressive over a period of time. But it's in the same sort of area of pathology. Now, um, uh, Dr. Pamela Davis, one of the lead uh, authors, uh, we thought would turn some of the tide by reducing the general risk factors such as high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity and sedentary lifestyle. So, I mean, there's no question that, out, that uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia is more common in people with these other risk factors, for example, for arterial disease. And while we've been treating people with high blood pressure, while we've been treating people with heart disease, obesity is a bit trickier, while we've been advising more exercise, we would hope these will reduce the, the, the incidence and the prevalence of, of dementia. But if this is another factor, um, that's going to potentially undo all of that good work and some is what she's worried about. And of course, that's perfectly uh, rational. Um, now, now so many people in the US have had COVID uh, and the long term consequences of COVID are still emerging. So is this going to affect more people? Remember, this data was only collected and this data is only starting to come out now. But this data only goes up to May uh, 2021, which is pre-Omicron. So uh, obvious questions in, in my mind here. Um, what's the difference between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated groups? Um, what's the difference between the, uh, the original Wuhan wild type virus, the Delta, the Alpha and the Omicron viruses? And what other comorbidities might be associated with the onset of uh, dementia as well? So a lot of questions still to answer there. But I'm, af I'm afraid the overall trend is now there. But more will emerge for sure. Uh, perhaps, unfortunately. Uh, it's important to continue to monitor the impact of disease and uh, future disability. Oh, well, of course, of course, of course. Uh, the group plan to continue studying the potential effects of COVID-19 on Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, such as, for example, Parkinson's disease. Um, these need to be studied as well, where the certain populations can be especially vulnerable. And the group also want to assess any drugs that could be repurposed to treat COVID-19's long-term side effects. Although I suspect the pharmaceutical industries will prefer new drugs that were under patent because they're associated with higher uh, profit margins. And just just before we finish, this was the um, this was, so all of these patients here. The, 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 this is this is the hazard ratio here. So that's one, and uh, this is one point five two. So all of these patients who'd had the infection had a greater chance. And for example, we see white men and black men have got fairly similar chances of uh, developing. Hispanic men slightly less. But as we said, the older age group more, the 70 to 84 slightly less and the 65 to 74 slightly less again. Um, that's the main reason I suspect that the infection is trigger is, is, is not triggering a new case of Alzheimer's. It's accelerating one that was already there. Because the older the individuals, the more likely they are to 
uh, develop it. But the overall figure is is a sixty nine percent. But as we say, eighty nine percent in the uh, over eighty fives, eighty nine percent increased risk, and uh, in the seventy five to eighty four, slightly uh, slightly less. And again, in the 65 to 74, slightly less again, but overall 69% increased risk. Now, if this is duplicated and there is um, a 69% increase in risk in Alzheimer's disease, I haven't calculated how many tens of thousands, millions of cases that would be per year, but this is going to be a huge, uh, significant increase in people with uh, dementia for which we have no cure at the moment now we're going to keep an eye on this it's one of the more serious long-term sequelae after the 1918 pandemic for example there, were, there was a condition called encephalitis uh, lethargica where people were just very tired and there's a lot of post encephalitic parkinson's disease as well so um, clear that viral infections in that case influenza can cause neurodegenerative disease uh, i think it's clear that um SARS coronavirus 2 infection is going to cause some. The question is how much. If it's 69% increased risk, that is concerning. Now, I think that's all I want to say on that one. Just before we finish, just talking about Parkinson's disease reminded me of something there. But lots of people have been asking me, um, has uh, President Putin got Parkinson's disease? Well, the last video I watched of him when he was uh, saying he needs 300,000 more people to fight in Ukraine. Um, I saw no sign of Parkinson's disease there. Now, I've worked with Parkinson's disease patients since I was 18. And it's true that you can cover the symptoms with medication. But you get you get like this rigidity of facial expression. With Parkinson's disease, and, and when you tell the patients to smile, they kind of go, "I can't mimic it," but they kind of go, just the edge of the face lifts up a bit like that. They, they, they have this mask-like expression, as well as the rigidity and tremor and the shakes and all the other things. And I'm afraid I saw none of that in in President Putin at all, and no indication that he'd covered Parkinson's side effects with uh, medication. So, uh, as 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 of now, I'm convinced he doesn't have Parkinson's disease. Just to answer the question that many people have uh, asked. Anyway, that's us for today. Um, it is a concerning report. Um, I can't see any immediate flaws in this paper, but let's hope uh, let's hope it's not as bad as this paper uh, indicates that it might be. But we're watching it closely. And for now, thank you for watching. <laughs>